A tragedy hits Baltimore Harbor, Boeing loses a CEO, and the United States breaks ranks with Israel at the United Nations. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, Jillian Tett of the Financial Times on investing in geopolitical risk. In some ways, what we're seeing right now is a back to the future. Josh Bolton of the Business Roundtable on what American CEOs want in their next president. The CEOs of the Business Roundtable are very concerned about the fiscal situation in the United States. And economist Melissa Carney on the fight over standardized tests at American universities. Students submitted SAT or ACT scores are very highly predictive of their academic performance when they get to college. But we start with Larry Fink of BlackRock and his annual letter to investors, focused this year on what he calls a retirement crisis in the United States and around the world, which is what Larry is hearing about more and more from BlackRock clients. My letters are a reflection of my conversation with clients. So it is, and, and so over the past year, I heard more and more conversation about retirement, the retirement crisis, from many parts of the world, from middle-class developing countries to developed countries. Um, the acute problem here in the United, United States is that we have still 57 million Americans who, who don't have any savings or any retirement plan. Social Security is a fantastic foundation for retirement. But if that's all you have when you retire, you're, you're going to be living in, 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 a, in, in poverty below the poverty line because it just is not, it's supplemental, but it's not meant to be the totality of what you have in retirement. And the whole concept of we're aging, we're, you know, we're all living longer. And I think one of the big narratives I've had to reflect in 2023 was the miracles of medicine. When we talk about the drugs like Ozempec and all the different uh, weight loss drugs, how that is extending life. It's, it's conquering kidney disease and liver disease and heart disease and joint disease. And, and, and then there are new medicines now for, for dementia that extends life. So if you, you think about the miracles of technology and how it transforms our lives and extends our life, there is not a dialogue in America or most places about can we afford that longevity? And our entire retirement system was based on statistics that were created 50 years ago, whereby most Americans retired between 60 and 62 then, but most Americans then passed away at uh, 67. And today, statistically, uh, a couple uh, 60 years old in good health, one of them is going to live over 90. Mm. And so. The other question is, should we reevaluate how we work and how long we work? Because we all need purpose in life. And in most, play, most people get find purpose, obviously, maybe with their grandchildren, their children, their, their community. Many people find purpose in their, in their jobs. Mm -hmm. And um, the thought of retiring at 60 with 30 more years or a 30 year, li year life in front of you, these, we need to have a dialogue. We need to have a conversation. And, you know, I'm an optimist. Yep. I am a very optimistic about the long-term vitality of, right. of, of our markets. I'm bullish on capitalism. Right. The reason why I'm bullish is that when I read the newspapers every morning and listen to Bloomberg and other news organizations, it's full of scary things. We talk about the problems. Yep. We talk about all the problems. Like, but we solve problems through conversation. Right. And the one area where we have no conversation is, is the affordability of retirement and the whole concept of retirement. And we need to start a global and most importantly, a national dialogue. Should we be changing the rules so we can put our 401ks or our IRAs into private markets? I, I believe there are some great um, areas of private markets that are going to be great investments for retirement. And I, I would channel that more towards infrastructure because mm -hmm. infrastructure is has a long maturity it has a higher coupon but it has a, a lower profile of returns than what I would say other areas of the private markets so it has a more uh, a good corridor of returns but higher probabilities of meeting those returns and so yes we need to be re-looking at 
how we think about investing, whether that is going to be in private equity or infrastructure. I do believe if, you know, we need to be putting more long-dated assets into retirement and so that you could, uh, so that you could meet the returns that you need uh, to have the pool of money that you, you, you require during, reti during retirement. In your letter, you talk a lot about the success of the capital markets, all that they've accomplished. At the same time, you do mention the problem with particularly U.S. debt. You, you think it's more urgent than any time, I think you said, you can remember in your lifetime. Uh, put those two things together. To what extent has, has the success of the capital markets come specifically because we've taken more debt on the public balance sheet? We've shifted debt from private balance sheets to public balance sheets. No question. Let, let's just use a, a, a statistic. And I think that I, when I talk about this statistic, I get frightened. In the year 2000, the U.S. deficit was $8 trillion. Today, it's $34 trillion. So 23 years later, we increased our deficit by $26 trillion. So for the first 230-odd, 40 years, we increased our deficit to $8 trillion. And in the last 23 years, we, went, we, we increased it by $26 trillion. I think that speaks volumes of what's happening in our, in, our, in our country today. The problem with these type of deficits is, and now with, with and I believe, higher interest rates for longer, the cost of financing our deficits are gonna erode more and more of our, uh, of our disposable income uh, as a country. And I do believe there, we're getting to a point where our public debt is going to start pry up, crowding out private capital, and we're going to have structurally higher interest rates. What can the private sector do to trigger mm. some action in that regard? I mean, you're the head of the largest asset manager in the world, Larry Fink. It's not just you, but you have some influence. At, at this point, we have candidates running for president who aren't even talking about this. It's subject. not even a conversation. Um, so in my letter, I talk about the need for more public-private investments. Well, the United States is one of the last countries where we've had private capital investing in, in our infrastructure. And I believe if we changed our policies, privatized our airports and privatized maybe our ports, and having private capital investing that, then our public spending could be rededicated to more urgent social needs, more urgent needs, elevating our education, elevating you know, our, our, you know, issues around Social Security and health care. And, and, and so I believe the need is to rethink what is the role and responsibility of the public sector for the development of better 21st century infrastructure. We know that we are going to have to digitize our entire economy. We know we're going to have to move forward on, on decarbonization. These require huge pools of money. Allow the private sector to be part of that. We have this enormous functional capital markets that can provide the capital. We as a country must use it more often and access the, the role of private sector. And, and so I think we still, um, you know, that does not change the course of our deficits, but we can certainly reallocate some of our monies into more urgent issues. And I, I, I would say, and my letter speaks about it, to we need to grow our economy so our deficits are a smaller component of our GDP. That is the bigger issue. If, our, if we continue to just grow at 2% and we have these type of deficits, that's when the deficits really are going to be a problem out five and 10 years. But you suggest 3%, is that realistic? We need, that has to be our target. We need to find ways of growing at 3% instead of just cutting taxes. Or we need to find ways of incenting private capital to be in, uh, investing more. We need to encourage growth. And we need to be, and this is a debate now, and I, there's a lot of people talking against this, we need to embrace our capitalism because our capitalism has shown to be the best economic force in the world. That was BlackRock's Larry Fink. Coming up, we talk with Glenn Hubbard of the Columbia Business School about how we could get the sort of economic growth that Larry Fink says we'll need to work through our debt problems. I think it's a mistake to use the sort of big spending industrial policy as opposed to that kind of partnership or research support. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. If growth is the goal, what are the most effective policy tools for getting us there? Is it public investment? Is it private investment? Trade policy? Tax policy? Glenn Hubbard advised President George W. Bush on these questions as chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. He is now Dean Emeritus at the Columbia Business School and author most recently of The Wall and the Bridge. So welcome back, Glenn. Always great to have Thanks. you here. So let's talk about growth because everybody talks about it. I'm not sure anybody does anything about it. But if that is our goal, that we want to get to growth, what drives that the most from your point of view as a matter of policy? Well, to me, that's the biggest question in economic policy, David. And I, I think growth is super important for our living standards, for our ability to do anything. There are policies that work, but we also have to remember to get social support for those policies. A lot of economists line up policies and all the angles that you listed all correctly, but without thinking about social support. We need to do both. So we've had the Biden administration now, which has tended to favor, to some extent, public investment. We have it in, 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 in uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. We have it in the Infrastructure Act. Uh, what is the role of public investment in order to get growth going? Well, public investment can play a big role in growth, but I don't think it's the type that we're seeing in the present industrial policy. I think of it as, could we invest more in basic research for ideas in general, for technology, for climate change mitigation, whatever you want? Could we put applied research centers around the country? Could we do more in defense, where we know we're going to have to build up, and use defense research spillovers in the private sector? All of those make sense to me. Inflation Reduction Act, less so. When it comes to industrial policy, what did the Trump administration do, the first Trump administration? There may be another one. Well, interestingly, one very successful piece of industrial policy in the first Trump administration was um, Operation Warp Speed, because there you have the government in a, essentially a public-private partnership, guaranteeing demand, expediting things. That strikes me as this kind of holistic approach that I'm mentioning. It's a smaller case, but a very important one. I think it's a mistake to use the sort of big spending industrial policy as opposed to that kind of partnership or research support. Some might say that President Trump, when he was there, used big spending in the form of tax cuts, because that is a form of expenditure, after all. Was that effective in getting private investment? Because I've read very mixed things about that. Well, I think it is. I mean, most of the scholarship I've seen on the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017 that you're referring to does indicate quite substantial increases in investment. Why is it mixed? Because remember, at the same time, we also had a protectionist policy tilt that's very anti-investment and anti-growth. But the pure effects of the tax cut were there. And I would think that the next Congress and the next president, whoever's in those various chairs, are going to have to figure out what to do about the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, because many of its provisions are expiring. Well, you took us to trade pretty quickly. What about trade? What is the role of trade policy in promoting growth? Well, unfortunately, this is one where both of our candidates are offering a fairly protectionist trade policy to the country. We need openness in markets. We need markets for American exports. We need to be open here uh, to other goods and services, unless there's a national security interest. But we also have to bring everybody along. And I would hope that either a President Biden or a President Trump would realize that and pose real-world policies, not just tariffs. We recently had another distinguished economist here, Paul Romer, who had an approach to trade that was a bit different from what I'd heard before, which is basically be protectionist when it comes to goods, importing of goods, but not when it comes to capital and ideas. That essentially, you say, come build it here, train our workers up, and we keep our jobs where we don't lose them to China, as many people think we did around 2000. Well, but this is what's curious about some of the present debates. We are having foreign investment in the United States and the jobs here, yet we're questioning Nippon Steel and U.S. Steel. We're questioning foreign automakers being in the United States. Why? We're hiring people here. We're building things here. So I agree. Uh, Glenn, what about the so-called crowding out phenomenon? That is to say, we're borrowing so much money, the debt and deficit is really crowding out investment. Are we seeing that? Is that inhibiting growth in the United States now? Well, it's certainly a factor. I think the bigger issue for deficits in debt is the future tax burdens that they imply. In a global capital market, interest rates themselves don't have to go up that much in response to U.S. borrowing. That said, we have to pay it back. And business people understand that. You and I understand that as individuals. Those are our future tax burdens. So it's definitely a problem. In a good economy, we're running mammoth deficits. The most recent Congressional Budget Office report says it's just going to get worse. Uh, we need to change. 
So let me be specific here and put a target on this. We had Larry Fink issue his uh, annual chairman's letter. For a long investors. chairman's long letter. letter. <laughs> That's right, but we read every word of it. And one of the things he said is the thing we need to do on the deficit is grow our way out of it. He was saying we need to grow at 3%, real growth, 3% real growth in order to get out of the deficit. Is that realistic? Are there policies we could adopt that would get us to that sort of bogey? We can get close. A lot depends on what you assume about productivity growth's response to artificial intelligence. So I, I think it might be possible. Technically, you can't grow your way out of the deficit. Our entitlement programs are linked in, to the real economy. But I, I certainly agree with Mr. Fink that, yes, growth is the number one thing that we could do. And there are a set of policies. We've talked about some of those that would push us in that direction. Coming up, geopolitics loom larger in investors' minds than they have for years. We talk with Jillian Tett of the Financial Times about investing in a troubled world. An entire generation was reared on the idea that if it's not in the model or in the balance sheet, it doesn't matter. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Investors are facing a sharp rise in political and geopolitical uncertainty, and yet markets seem to be assuming everything's just fine. To take us through this apparent disconnect, welcome back now Jillian Tett, columnist and member of the editorial board of the Financial Times and provost of King's College, Cambridge. Jillian, great to have you back with us. Great to be here, particularly at these crazy, weird times. Yeah, exactly. And you wrote a column just recently, actually, about TikTok. And you think it's about TikTok and social media, but it went beyond that to talk about how capricious governments, certainly China, but also the United States are, and how investors have to sort of accommodate that. Absolutely. I mean, what I was really trying to talk about in the TikTok column was the fact that we have this paradox in markets. On the one hand, you have markets soaring on the back of a pretty good short-term economic outlook, a lot of relief about the so-called soft landing, and excitement about the idea the Fed will cut rates later this year. But at the same time, we have really quite unprecedented levels of medium to long-term geopolitical risk and domestic political risk. And TikTok is one example of that in a fairly extreme form because until a couple of years ago, there were a lot of big private capital players who assumed this was going to be one of the hottest things in the tech landscape. Um, people were talking about it potentially being the most lucrative and profit-generating trade that they'd seen for a long time. But, of course, now we know that Washington is considering um, forcing TikTok to essentially be banned if ByteDance's parent doesn't sell off um, TikTok um, to an outside player. Um, and so suddenly geopolitical risk has come in and spot the party. And that's a metaphor for what's happening or what could happen in many, many asset classes and in relation to many types of securities going forward. And my concern is that investors are simply not realizing the magnitude of that risk. Jillian, we all know you for your work at the Financial Times, how you've covered international finance for many, many years. At the same time, I want to go back to your original training, because I love to talk to you as a social anthropologist. That's where you have your PhD. Apply that, if you can, to investors. What are they missing here? Is it because they're wishing themselves to success and just saying, let's make, make believe there aren't these problems? Is it because it's just too difficult to try to discount this geopolitical risk in China or the United States? I think the key thing investors are missing right now is that if you look back at the second half of the 20th century, that was an era when we saw the rise of all kinds of intellectual tools that were very useful for navigating the world, like balance sheets, like economic models, like opinion polls. And all of those rose on the back of the computer revolution and the fact that it became possible to crunch huge amounts of data for the first time on a large scale. Now, the problem with all of those tools is that although they're incredibly useful, they're only as good as what you put into your model, onto your balance sheet, onto your opinion poll. And what you leave out can sometimes matter enormously. And the story of the last few years is that what has been left out, what's been a footnote in the balance sheet or an externality to the economic model, like medical risk, like environmental issues, like social upheaval, like rapid tech change, or now domestic politics and geopolitics, those issues that were not included in those fancy computerized models are suddenly becoming the model in the sense they're most important. 
And from a cultural perspective, an entire generation was reared on the idea that if it's not in the model or on the balance sheet, it doesn't matter. And now they're waking up and realizing with a shock that's wrong. That was no surprise to the people who were investing before the eras of model making and balance sheet um, fine tuning, but it is a surprise now because of this cultural pattern. Uh, Julian, I want to pick up on one thing you refer to as political risk. As we face uh, an election here in the United States, there are elections around the world, but we tend to focus on the presidential one here. And is there a new element of uncertainty in misinformation? Because I know you've done a lot of work on that subject. And there is, by the way, which may tie us back into TikTok, because that's some of the objections about TikTok. Absolutely. The issue of misinformation is a classic issue which was not appearing on the economist model or even, frankly, on many politicians or political models in the past. Um, and the issue cuts both ways. On the one hand, there really is a very real risk that AI and other types of tech, digital technologies will end up manipulating or meddling with the whole voting process in a way that discredits potentially the outcome in November. The other risk, though, for investors is that fear of that causes some very unpredictable and potentially capricious reactions from Washington that could potentially hurt the tech sector. And what we see in the last year or two is the tech sector boom dramatically on the idea that these extraordinary technological breakthroughs around AI would keep generating more and more profits and enable American business to boom. That may be the case. But anyone investing in tech today has to think about the ways that the growing politicization of tech could essentially upend their models and projections for the future as well. And yes, TikTok ByteDance is an extreme case, but it's certainly not the only one at the moment that's out there that investors need to think about. Julian, let me do something that is uncomfortable for you as a journalist to put a crystal ball in front of us. You're a journalist, you report, you don't predict the future. But based on your experience, how do you think investors will come to adjust to the issues that you're saying? Uh, will, will we develop an Excel spreadsheet for geopolitical risk or will we just have to hedge a great deal more and actually take less risk to begin with? Well, I think that you're already seeing an adjustment process in the sense that you're getting consultancies that handle political risk booming dramatically in a way they weren't two decades ago. At the same time, you're seeing groups like the CFA introducing a much wider set of ideas into the analysis that they do and their educational programs. But at the end of the day, the only way to really hedge or prepare for this kind of geopolitical risk is to do two things. Firstly, study history and realize that your own memory, your own life cycle is very short and it pays to see what people were doing 100 years ago when they faced this kind of geopolitical risk without flashy computer models. And secondly, that old adage of diversify, diversify, diversify. And the last point I'll make is that in some ways what we're seeing right now is a back to the future in the sense that anyone after World War II was quite used to the idea the government had a big, potentially capricious role in the economy and in the business sphere. After the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions, those ideas fell away. In some ways, we're going back to the idea the government can indeed intrude in companies and the markets with TikTok or anything else. And in many ways, looking back to understand the future is quite a valuable precept to have right now. Jillian, it's always such a great treat to have you on Wall Street Week. This is Jillian Tett of the Financial Times and King's College, Cambridge. Coming up, what do American CEOs think about the upcoming election? We ask the head of the Business Roundtable, Josh Bolton. The business community has been very disappointed with the regulatory environment uh, in the United States today. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. As we move closer to the presidential election in November, Global Wall Street focuses on what the differing economic policies of the two frontrunners, President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump, could mean for business. For his views, we welcome back now Josh Bolton. He's president and CEO of the Business Roundtable and former chief of staff to President George W. Bush. So, Josh, welcome back. Good to have you. Before we get into what November might mean for business, let's talk about where we are right now. I know quarterly you do a survey of your CEOs who are your members. Where do your CEOs think we are as an economy right now? David, thanks for having me back. Um, our CEOs are in a pretty comfortable place 
Every quarter, we ask them about their expectations for sales over the coming six months and their plans for CapEx and hiring over that same period. Uh, and we, uh, we combine the results into a headline index um, that is basically a pretty good barometer of CEO sentiment. Uh, and the CEOs in the business roundtable, their sentiment for the coming six months is pretty good. For the first time since uh, the third quarter of 2022, the, that headline index is above its historic average. So it's not, it's not exuberant, it's not uh, going gangbusters as far as our CEOs are concerned, um, but uh, they, say, they see things as in pretty good shape for the, uh, for the coming six months um, based on uh, economic fundamentals. And uh, it seems to me, David, that the one thing that might throw them off of that optimistic outlook is something that happens in uh, something dramatic that happens in our politics or our geopolitics. So let's talk about that specific, because you, as I say, you had experience in the White House. You know wherever you speak. How much of a difference does it make who is in the, in the White House, no matter who it is? Can the president really affect the economy substantially? Well, from the standpoint of our businesses, enormously. Um, and in particular, during periods when the tax code is open for uh, renegotiation, when there are uh, potential trade deals on the table that might or might not happen depending on who's in charge. Um, the regulatory environment is dramatically influenced by, um, by who's in the White House. Uh, so all of those things can really affect uh, the, uh, the business outlook from, from the standpoint of our country's biggest corporations. Let's take those three that you've mentioned, starting with taxes. Uh, and the difference, as we perceive it right now, between the two front runners, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Joe Biden has said he wants to increase taxes, and specifically on corporations. Presumably, President Trump would want to renew the so-called tax cuts, the Trump tax cuts. So uh, how does business perceive the alternative between these two individuals? Well, uh, business very much welcomed the tax cuts that passed in 2017. They had a, have a lot to do with the prosperity that we enjoyed before the pandemic and that we enjoy now is a, uh, a reasonable tax environment. You know, uh, prior to 2017, the United States was among the highest taxed jurisdictions in uh, among developed countries. Um, the 2017 Act didn't didn't bring us to the head of the pack, but it put us in the middle of the pack where it's possible for U.S. companies to compete. In 2025, a lot of those provisions that brought us back into a competitive range are going to expire, and uh, there will be a big debate about what to do with a whole range of tax uh, provisions on both the corporate and the individual side. Uh, and the, uh, the occupant of the White House is going to have a lot to say about whether uh, taxes go up or remain roughly, roughly where they are. Um, the, uh, the composition of the Congress for that purpose is also going to be very important. And as close as it looks like uh, polling suggests that our presidential elections will be, um, the, uh, the control of both houses of Congress is also very much in doubt. Uh, Josh, as you know so well, uh, taxes in Washington amount to revenue. I mean, if you cut taxes, you lower revenue as well, typically. Uh, how concerned are business CEOs, CEOs of big corporations, about our debt and deficit situation? Because there's a lot of concern on economists' point. Yeah, and um, as a former budget director, I'm I'm concerned as well. Uh, the the CEOs of the business roundtable are very concerned about the fiscal situation of the United States. Um, but from from their perspective, uh, the United States doesn't really have a problem that we're undertaxed. Um, certainly on the corporate side, um, we have a problem of overspending. And if you look at historic data about taxation, tax revenue as a percentage of GDP and government spending as a percentage of GDP, you see that the tax revenue over time is, is rel we're in a, a 
relatively historically average place in how much of our GDP taxes are taking. Uh, what's gone way out of whack is the uh, is the spending. And so um, our members would like to see the Congress uh, and the president come together on sensible ways to uh, to control what has been out of control spending uh, and uh, not try to solve the deficit problem on the backs of uh, of our businesses because uh, our economy will not flourish if uh, if the uh, the tax environment is not competitive and we are at risk of becoming a once again, an uncompetitive competitive tax jurisdiction. The second thing you mentioned was trade and tariffs. Uh, of course, uh, President Trump, when he was president, imposed a variety of tariffs. Those, for the most part, have not come off under President Biden. We're now talking about further tariffs from candidate Donald Trump at the present time. How concerned is the business community with increased tariffs, particularly some of the ones we're talking about, like 50, 60 percent, even 100 percent on Chinese products? Yeah, that would be uh, it would be highly disruptive. Um, the United States cannot operate in in the modern world as its own bubble of, uh, of a protected economy. We are in a global economy, and we damage our own prosperity and our own future competitiveness if we try to protect ourselves. Uh, via tariffs or any other measure from a global international trading environment. Nobody knows that better than uh, the big companies that are members of the Business Roundtable because they operate in, uh, most of them operate in many countries around the world, and uh, they need to be able to compete. A uh, 10% tariff across the board uh, would be a huge tax on the American people, uh, and uh, to the extent that those are goods that consumers use, the consumer would pay the cost of that. And to the extent that a 10% tariff makes it more expensive uh, for companies to produce here in the United States because their inputs are more expensive, we'd be driving business overseas. So from the perspective of, uh, of business, um, a tariff like that would be a, a huge mistake. And uh, we certainly hope that doesn't come to pass as a, as a policy matter. Overall, what the business community would like to see is a real affirmative trade agenda from the, from the United States. That is negotiating trade deals, especially with our friends and allies in Asia, um, which is the only way we're gonna succeed in competing with China. The third thing you mentioned was regulation. Obviously, Donald Trump, when he was president, had a very deregulatory agenda. President Biden has not embraced that. In fact, in some areas, such as antitrust enforcement, has really doubled down on regulation. Give us a sense of how the business community perceives this alternative on regulation between these two candidates. Um, the, uh, the business community has been very disappointed with the regulatory environment uh, in the United States today. Um, in that same survey we just talked about, we asked our CEOs the question of, do they think that, um, that government policy is undermining uh, free enterprise in the United States? And uh, over three quarters of them said, yes, they do believe that government policy is undermining free enterprise. And among those who said yes, almost all of them cited regulation as a key concern, uh, and about two thirds of them said that uh, antitrust policy is a key concern. So uh, the uh, the business community is is not happy with the regulatory uh, approach that the Biden administration has taken, particularly um, out of the Securities Exchange Commission, um, but a lot of other areas as well. Um, we're uh, we're hopeful to get improvements on that score. Uh, but on that score, a Trump administration would almost certainly be preferable. Josh, thank you so much for being on Wall Street Week once again. That is Josh Bolton of the Business Roundtable. Coming up, the fight over standardized tests. Are they helping or hurting us make sure the right people get into college? We ask economist Melissa Carney of the University of Maryland. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Matching prospective students with the right college opportunities has never been more important for the students and for their future employers, which has led to greater scrutiny of the standardized tests used to screen applicants, with some colleges turning away from the SAT and the ACT and some schools returning to them after giving them up. To take us through the pluses and minuses of standardized tests, welcome back now Melissa Carney, professor of economics at the University of Maryland. Melissa, great to have you back with us. So first of all, let me just ask the most basic question. Do they work? Do SATs and ACTs, are they accurate in predicting success in post-secondary education? Yes, is the short answer. The data that comes out of college records has revealed very clearly that students submitted SAT or ACT scores are very highly predictive of their academic performance when they get to college much more so than guidance counselor recommendation letters or even their high school grades. In some sense, the fact that the test scores are more predictive of college academic performance than high school grades is not surprising given how much variation there is across high schools in grading standards and academic rigor. And of course, rampant grade inflation has made grades less meaning meaningful. And so test scores are just very predictive and a really important signal that colleges have access to when they're looking for the right match, the right academic match between students and their level of academic rigor. What about the claims that I've seen that there's some cultural bias to these standardized tests? And by the way, they disadvantage students coming from less fortunate families. Yeah, there's a couple points to make here. First, researchers who have looked for this find that the test scores are very predictive of academic performance in college for students from different backgrounds. And so that counters the idea that it's not helpful for students from less advantaged backgrounds or it's biased against them. The second really important fact here is that college admissions officers don't consider standardized test scores in a vacuum. They're very open and, and transparent about the fact that they evaluate these in the context. The bar for what would be considered an impressive score is higher for students coming from more advantaged backgrounds than less advantaged backgrounds. And so that's really important to realize that admissions officers are contextualizing the scores when they're submitted. And by the way, this is why test the move to test optional or test blind made it particularly difficult for kids from less advantaged backgrounds to signal to more academically rigorous schools that they were prepared. It's actually a particularly important signal for kids from less advantaged backgrounds to be able to deliver to university or college admissions officers who might not know their high school very well, for instance. Yeah, so there are various advantages people coming from families that, are, that have more wealth have, but one of them is this incredible industry that's grown up around preparing for the SAT and SAT, ACT. I'll just go to my personal experience. As you know, I'm involved in a charity in Yonkers helping the public school system. You go across the border to Bronxville, those kids are all getting tutoring, which costs a fair amount of money, not so much in Yonkers. Doesn't that skew the system? Yeah, but, but admissions officers are aware of that. So what they would see from a kid coming from Yonkers who likely doesn't have access to that kind of tutoring or, or preparation, really, they're not going to evaluate the scores the same. The report coming out of Dartmouth about why they're going back to requiring tests is very clear on this. So they use the example of a student from a, an advantaged background, a high-income family, a school that sends a lot of kids to selective schools, a 1,400 on the SAT would not have helped that student gain admission to Dartmouth. But for a student like your student from, from that you brought up from Yonkers, a 1,400 would have been very helpful to them in earning admission. The problem is when the schools went test optional, kids from different backgrounds were equally likely to withhold a score of 1,400, presumably for because kids from less advantaged backgrounds don't have access to the savvy college counselors who are more attuned to how the game is played and would have told them, no, this score is helpful for you. You're not being compared to the overall um, average or distribution. And so that's why the kids who were most harmed by the elimination of the test score requirement were really high-achieving kids from less advantaged backgrounds. And that's a big part of the reason that schools like Dartmouth and Brown and MIT and Yale are saying they're going back to requiring these tests. Uh, certainly getting the right student into the right college is a starting point, but it's not the ending point. They also have to succeed once they get there. They have to make it all the way through. And the track record there that I've read about is not so great about a lot of uh, children making it all the way through, and particularly ones from less advantaged families. What can we do to make sure they succeed once they get there? I think this is really important. So, for instance, the University of California school system is still test blind, 
And people who are championing that have pointed out that those schools are now enrolling more students from underrepresented minority groups, less advantaged backgrounds. But the problem is if that access is coming at a cost of less academic match. And so you're bringing in students who are less likely to thrive and you're undermining the match between the academic preparation of a student and the academic rigor of a particular campus. So getting the match right is critically important. We don't want to throw out signals of the match quality. And then students who are disadvantaged when they get to college you know, work has shown that a lot of students need a lot of support systems, and you want to be able to make sure that students are being well served by the campuses they're at. That's a different problem. And by the way, there's a related problem here, which is the fact that students from different backgrounds are much, you know, they have different levels of academic preparation by the time they're 18. That's not the fault of standardized test scores. That is a reflection of rampant inequality and class gaps and opportunities and schools and family background and all sorts of things that affect a student's likelihood of excelling in college when they're 18. And so, again, throwing out the metrics that show us these gaps exist don't mean the gaps don't exist. They just make us make it harder for us to identify them and know to where to put our efforts. We in the media cover this subject a great deal, I would say. We tend, I think, to focus on Ivy League schools. I'm saying that somebody who comes from University of Michigan, not an Ivy League school. Maybe I'm a little bit uh, insecure about that. But it, give us a sense of how big a problem it is in the Ivy League schools as opposed to those state schools like I came from. I'm really glad you brought this up, and I'm proud to teach at one of these flagship state universities, University of Maryland. Um, but so let me be clear. The, all of the media emphasis and even our public leaders talk about what's happening in admissions at these private elite schools. The Ivy League, all eight schools combined, serve less than 1% of the 10.8 million students enrolled in four-year institutions in this country. So whatever these schools are doing in admissions, whether it comes to their testing regime or legacy admissions, is really not that material to the story of higher education in this country. I mean, it's very frustrating to me how much attention we give these schools, given that the flagship universities, the University of Michigan, University of Maryland, the SUNY system, the CUNY system, they serve so many more students than all of the Ivies put together. But here's another way to look at this. Over the past 30 years, our country has produced a million more college, four-year college degree holders than in 1990, okay? So we went from just over a million to just over two million. Do you know how many more degrees were granted by the Ivies? Combined, an additional 3,500. So when it comes to expanding access to higher education, the story is just not at the elite private schools. And so we need to be talking about what's happening at the state schools, the public schools, their lack of funding. That's where the real story is. And finally, Melissa, we just had a new budget proposed with the federal government. You spent a lot of time looking at that. I know you're concerned about the deficit and the debt that we're building up. At the same time, what did you see in that budget, if anything, that could help this problem of really making sure we're supporting kids coming from less fortunate families? What I would have liked to see in the budget is a much bigger allocation of funding towards spending on kids towards spending on less advantaged groups. I mean, we spend more on interest on the debt at this point than we do on all federal programs aimed at children. If we want to equip more students to be in a position to thrive in college, if we want to close class gaps to build up our workforce, we need to be shifting the budget, not just away from deficit spending and interest payments, but really to have a more dedicated focus on forward-looking investments. And that, that means in, in kids. Um, and younger generation in this country. That's what I would have liked to have seen in the budget. <laughs> Melissa, it's always a treat to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. That's Melissa Carney of the University of Maryland. Coming up, paying the price for leadership from Congress to the C-suite. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. One of the great leaders of the 20th century, Winston Churchill, said that the price of greatness is responsibility. We've been watching as some people striving for greatness are being held responsible, like House Speaker Mike Johnson, who found a way to get the Congress to keep the government funded, only to be confronted with one of his own Republican colleagues trying to kick him out of his job.
We need a new speaker. This is not personal against Mike Johnson. He's a very good man, and I, I have respect for him as a person, but he is not doing the job. Where President Xi of China, who aspires to greatness by making sure he holds the reins of power in his economy, but may end up bearing responsibility for its slowing growth. I think this is all about state control. You know, Xi Jinping is all about control, and right now China's all about Xi Jinping. This week we saw the price of greatness in the corporate world, as Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun announced that he'd be stepping down after a series of problems with Boeing planes undermined confidence in his leadership, especially from his airline customers. Everybody's worried about Boeing. We've got to get Boeing back to the point where it, it produces an impeccable product. And Nelson Peltz continues to do his dead-level best to hold Bob Iger responsible after years of great performance as Disney CEO as his proxy battle comes to a climax at the annual shareholders meeting on Wednesday. This really is a story not necessarily about Nelson Peltz, though Disney is actually sort of pushing that, uh, that line, uh, but really it's more about the governance of the company itself. But perhaps the strangest example of someone trying to hold a leader responsible comes from NBC which last Friday announced it would be adding Ronna McDaniel as an on-air contributor just two weeks after she stepped down as chair of the Republican National Committee. In a memo to staff, the NBC senior vice president for politics said that, quote, it couldn't be a more important moment to have Ms. McDaniel on the team. Well, other members of the NBC team begged to disagree. Chuck Todd, Rachel Maddow, Joe Scarborough, and Mika Brzezinski all very publicly objected in some pretty strong terms to what their leadership had done. And so NBC promptly reversed course and decided that Ms. McDaniel would not be joining its team after all. Look, let me deal with the elephant in the room. Yeah. I think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation because I don't know what to believe. Trust me, this isn't the first time that those in the newsroom have challenged decisions made by leadership. When I ran ABC News, there were any number of times that my colleagues took issue with things I was doing. Everything from giving Leonardo DiCaprio a role on an Earth Day special to using digital technology to cut the size of some of our crews in the field. I even had some internal pushback when I brought George Stephanopoulos on, and it came from none other than Peter Jennings, the journalist's journalist. Peter told me I was making a big mistake because George had not been trained in the craft, and even worse, he'd spent time in the Clinton White House several years before. Looking back on it now, the issue seems almost quaint, given the first-rate reporter, interviewer, and anchor George has become. And in fairness to Peter, after he'd worked with him for a few months, he came back to me to say he'd been wrong, that George had the instincts and the work ethic of the best journalists in our newsroom. But then again, I'm not aware that George Stephanopoulos ever challenged the legitimacy of an election that he'd lost. We should all be concerned about the care, custody, integrity of every ballot. But that's he, all I'm saying. And you know what? This is a viewpoint of a lot of Republicans, and they think Joe Biden's the president, but they also think there were problems, and both can be true. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and this is Bloomberg. See you next week.